Hello, this is a Brighter Futures film short about how research improves policy and changes people's lives. It's my great pleasure to welcome Maria Hudson from the Essex Business School. Uh, in this episode, we're talking about inequalities, particularly in the workplace and the impact upon uh, mental health. Um, so Maria, your expertise is in social injustice in the workplace and its impact upon people. Um, could you tell us a bit about your research and uh, your key findings from that? Certainly. Well, some of my recent research has been funded by ACAS and I've undertaken a research project that explored the role of staff race networks, their potential role in helping to address inequalities. And that project arose in the context of the Black Lives Matters uh, social and political uh, movement and uh, ACAS's interest in trying to uh, develop work that would engage with the issues and concerns that were being raised across the employment uh, landscape. And uh, it really chimed with my own uh, long-standing interests in the, in the field. So what I did was to undertake a series of case studies with a range of organisations uh, engaging with staff race networks and some of the key stakeholders uh, that were involved. So on the whole, some um, qualitative research was under, undertaken. And what I found was some very passionate people within organisations who were concerned about race inequalities and the persistent um, issues that we see vis-a-vis -vis, uh, ethnic pay gaps, and also uh, barriers to progression within the organisations. There are long-standing issues around yeah. the underrepresentation of ethnic minority groups at senior levels. And I was impressed by the way in which the, the uh, race networks were getting organised, you know, setting up their steering groups, trying to develop innovative ways of sharing leadership and getting a wider range of members um, within the, the workplace um, involved. And it, it really threw up, I think, um, both a series of challenges for race networks and also some insight, uh, I guess the flip side, some of the, the, the factors that enable staff race network uh, success. So the, the starting context is such networks are needed to give Absolutely. people some sense of togetherness, that, that, that they're not alone when facing these inequalities, um, uh, which of course, as you said, the Me Too movement was a very clear expression of, of not being alone um, and Black Lives Matter. Um, uh, tell us a bit how that kind of togetherness then helps people to um, secure their own sense of kind of worth and identity, but also perhaps some kind of tangible benefits, as you say, closing inequality gaps, closing pay gaps and so forth. Well, the, the members of the networks really value the opportunity to come together and to share their experiences, because often you have people who have particular experiences um, which they feel may be isolated within the organisation and uh, they feel that they're lacking in, in support. So they may be experiencing discrimination in the workplace and they feel that they're lacking support. And to come together within a staff race network, research participants said time and time again how invaluable it was to, to, to have that, that sense that other people were sharing similar um, experiences and offering social support. So that was a really important thing. Uh, but I think the networks also offer the members um, information support and try and um, think about ways in which they can, on an individual level, support people in trying to address some of the barriers that they, that they encounter. So, for example, trying to um, develop um, uh, and advocate for training initiatives. Um, taking positive action within organisations to try to address some of those mm. barriers to um, progression. But I think a really um, important dimension of that is the recognition uh, within the staff race networks that they need to engage with senior leaders within the organisation. And presumably these are both private and public sector organisations. That's organizations. right. The, Do majori you see the majority of um, networks uh, were public 
sector organisations, those that participated mm. in the research. Mm. But I did have a public, a private sector um, organisation that also got um, got got involved, and there was there was quite a lot of um, similarity. Um, in approaches that were being taken by the network. And this theme around the importance of senior leaders um, engaging was, um, was one that kind of cut across the case study um, organisations. And um, I think the, the networks felt that uh, they were able to um, build some traction in the dialogue that they were having with uh, senior, uh, senior leaders. But it wasn't without, uh, it wasn't without challenges. Um, so there could be patchy support within um, management cadres within uh, within their within their workplaces, um, but at their at their best, where there was very good a good level of senior management um, buy in, that really helped to drive through change within um, the organisation. A nice example of that that was being practiced in several. Um, organisations was uh, the introduction of reverse uh, mentoring. So just as people like to come together within race networks to share their um, experiences of, of, of racism, um, they, they felt that it was important to be kind of outward looking and engage with those who maybe are in more privileged positions within organisations mm -hmm. to share that um, to share that experience. And uh, it was interesting that um, both the members of the networks as well as uh, management colleagues um, who got involved in those processes felt that they were quite a valuable way to build real understanding of the concerns of ethnic minority and members and within the workplace. If we were, if we were being um, just solely kind of, as it were, instrumental about it, if you can create greater network connections, togetherness within organisations, um, you're getting the best out of all of your staff, not just some of them, um, because people are able to feel as though their creative ideas and actions are actually contributing to the benefit of the organisation. But then, of course, there's actually the individual components, which is, you know, why waste this expertise by not giving people a voice? So is this, this is more than just togetherness and voice, isn't it? It's about about action that follows from that. Yeah, there, I yeah. mean, there was certainly a sense from the networks that uh, there was a business case for um, employers to support the work that they were trying to do, for employers to work in partnership with them in supporting the work that they were trying to do in addressing um, uh, inequalities within the organisation alongside a social justice case mm. that employers should be engaging because it was the right thing uh, to, to do. I, mean, I think another important point here is around the importance of acknowledging that not all managers are going to be supportive. And uh, there were varying degrees to which um, employers were engaging with that in the organisations. And I think that that raises some important issues for the future in terms of when organisations talk about a zero policy um, approach to racism, what that actually means yeah. in practice, because um, uh, I found evidence of race networks and their members feeling quite disillusioned if their perception of what zero tolerance meant didn't quite match up yes. with what uh, the employer's perception was. And uh, I think it's worth highlighting that one of the case study organisations had uh, a senior leader that was extremely passionate about addressing uh, racism. And um, he came across as being uh, very clear on what zero tolerance meant. Uh, and part of that included uh, recognising that managers had accountability for addressing racism in organisations and that where managers, for whatever reason, weren't really buying into the organisational commitment to addressing racism, then there was an issue of discipline there and yeah. those procedures needed to be needed to be used. So I think that there's more research that needs to be done around that, both in terms of where those kinds of steps are taken successfully and effectively, and where there's a reluctance within the organisation to go down and that is, path. Is there, a, is there a time component? Is there, is there an element of you can't, that one can't necessarily get everybody on the bus to begin with, as it were, as it sometimes takes time to educate, to make people aware, to bring them along. As you've described, if you've got 
complete buy-in from a senior member of staff, that is going to send important signals, vitally important signals. Um, but presumably one could also find a way of influencing them over time um, whilst, when and whilst the networks are developing their own strength and their own action. Absolutely. I, I wouldn't underestimate the importance of um, building allies in trying to address racism and building awareness of some of the, the issues. And race networks certainly uh, seem to play a vital um, part um, in, in, in doing that. But I guess the, the, the sticking point comes when after a period of time that there are still issues and then the organisations um, need to, uh, thinking from the perspective of the race networks and their members, the organisations then need to be um, addressing that. And that really does seem to be a sticking point that can lead, contribute to the atrophy of the networks as people start to think, well, what, what, what are we doing? Yeah, why, why are we giving up mm. our time? Because mm. I've met some extremely committed mm. people through this research. They're often under-resourced in terms of the work that they're trying to, to do in partnership um, with, their, uh, with, their, with their employers. And um, disillusion. Can, can set in when the results aren't coming and the difficult um, decisions and actions, the difficult decisions aren't being made and the important actions aren't being yeah. taken. So if you were to then translate that into, I mean, presumably other forms of networks, staff networks can play a similar sort of role, uh, women's networks, um, uh, networks of particular cultures, for example. You've described a specific benefit of that kind of acting together. It's not just about coping, it's actually about transformation. It's about change. Absolutely, things. it's about transformation. And the point that you make, Jules, I think is really important in terms of re recognising um, that um, uh, some of the experiences that people have are actually quite intersectional. Yeah. And um, the race networks uh, recognise this within their organisations. And you could see collaborations um, taking place that recognition of similarity of interests across the networks, um, as well as uh, some, of the, some of the differences. And uh, a real understanding that um, race network members need to bring their whole selves to work. And that in doing that, part of that can be about um, their, their race, but it can also be about um, other aspects of their identity as well. And their creativity as well for the organisation. Absolutely. In that specific sense. Absolutely. So could we just conclude with a couple of kind of headline policy recommendations that you would make? You've done the work for ACAS, an important conciliation and arbitration service. I mean, that's very important uh, as a national institution. Um, what, what would be a couple of key policy lessons that you would take from the way that these networks are working and um, also some of the barriers that they're facing? I would pick up again, uh, first of all, on the role of managers. Yeah. We need uh, senior leaders within organisations to, to take a strong stance against racism and to take meaningful action. And they need to be um, accountable for that. They need to be, um, take responsibility. Addressing racism is all of our responsibility, but senior leaders within organisations are in a pivotal role role to make a real difference in terms of um, affecting um, engendering change in organisational cultures and um, practices. I would also highlight that it's really important that organisations not only appreciate the work that um, networks do within organisations, and there is appreciation, but they need to recognise some of the challenges as well. And I highlighted um, a moment ago how network members um, and their leaders put in a lot of time in trying to address racism within organisations and they're not always as supported as they, as they should be. Maria Hudson, thank you very much indeed. You've been watching A Brighter Futures film short. For more on how ideas improve lives, pop over to our sister podcast, Louder Than Words.